You are listening to the Wool Academy podcast. This is episode number 71. Hello and welcome. My name is Elizabeth van Delden and once a week we talk to an industry expert from the wool industry supply chain from farm to fashion and beyond, delivering strategies and insights to be successful in wool and showcasing those beautiful stories wool has to tell. My guest today is Chris Kirsten. He is the Director of Market Engagement and Public Outreach of the Savory Institute. Chris, welcome to the show. It's so good to have you. Hello, it's so good to be here. I'm super excited. Yes, me too, because we have lots to talk about. And right. let's start uh, with you introducing yourself and telling us a little bit more about the work that you do. Sure, yeah. So like you said, I'm Chris Kirsten and I work at the Savory Institute. The Savory Institute uh, is based in Boulder, Colorado. And for, oh, I don't know, it was founded by Alan Savory. We can, we can probably dive into Alan a little bit here, but for you know, probably 10, 15 years, you know, from really just after high school, early college, I was really interested in the work that, that they were doing. Uh, I was, um, um, I was farming full time then. So I used to run a ranch, uh, in Northern California. Um, I, well, I had, I had a, a ranch of my own and then I used to manage a ranch that it had 2000 acres, Uh, that's about 700 hectares. Um, and we had stone fruits and citrus and avocados and pomegranates and persimmons and pears. Uh, we had one crop roll into the next all year round, all orchard crops. And then we had 600 acres of hundred year old olive trees, which for, you know, Europeans that have access to, you know, Eastern European and middle, middle Eastern, Northern Africa trees, those, those are babies. But for North America, that was the largest old growth planting of olives on this continent. Uh, and so that was super exciting. And then what we did that was really innovative is we used the savory techniques, which we'll get more into, but what we did is we utilized livestock in our orchard. So the, the sheep and the cows did the mowing, goats handled invasive weeds, chickens debugged and fertilized. Uh, we cut our fuel usage by two thirds of the baseline a decade prior. Most years it was closer to 85%. We had you know, uh, less labor needs because the animals did the work for us. We were more popular with our buyers and with consumers because we came you know, one-stop shopping for them. So now they could get you know, grass-fed meat and extra virgin olive oil and uh, organic stone fruits and citrus and all these other specialty crops all at one place. Um, and so that was really where I, you know, cut my teeth on in this whole movement was was really being a fan of the Savory Institute's work and in holistic management uh, and also being a practitioner as I implemented these techniques uh, on the properties that I was managing. Wow, that sounds really amazing. And I even read about you that you also had tourists uh, visiting you and staying on the farm. Yeah, we, we partnered actually with a European company and they have um, fabric sided cabins or, you know, safari tents, basically, that they put on various farm properties around the world. And then they manage all the bookings and marketing and uh, logistics and everything else to get people to stay on the on the farms. And it was super cool. We were one of the, the first ones in, in the US and we actually helped so I still live in Northern California. I've been in California my whole life. Um, we helped write the agritourism laws for California, and we were one of kind of the first state pilots to kind of see how this would work. And um, the, the, the state really let us paint with a broad brush. They really gave us a lot of freedom as a pilot to be able to try some new things. It was super cool. It was really fun to be a part of. Yeah, that sounds really amazing. And it also touches on a topic we'll talk about later about educating the consumer and bringing them yeah. closer to the processor but before we do that um please uh, yeah talk a little bit more about alan savory and his history and how that all connects to the savory institute yeah so alan savory is an ecologist and he was born in rhodesia uh which is now zimbabwe he fought in their their long bloody civil war uh actually served in politics there but his his first role in love was always as a wildland or, or a game biologist. Uh, he loves wildlife. Uh, and for most of his early life, uh, into his 30s, he, he didn't like ranchers. He hated them. He really saw them as competing with 
uh, the food and water available for wildlife and that they were actually destroying habitats, which in some case he was, in cases he was right. Um, and about 50, 60 years ago, uh, he started to have an awakening where he had some ranchers that came to him and said, you know, we see the same degradation that you're talking about and we love our land and we love the ecology here and we would like to work with you to see how we can get our, our livestock uh, to stop this process, to do less bad, basically. And so he started working with them. He went out to their land. And, and the, the real big epiphany moment is he found this spot in the pasture, um, or in the felt, that it was, it was lush and green. And it was only, you know, 10 meters wide or something like that. But there was this circle of lush green grass, and it was right along the fence. And he said, what happened here? And he said there was a st- the rancher said there was a storm one night and the the sheep bedded down here, and um, this is where they they spent the night. And he said there's something going on here. And what he started to realize was that ruminants, whether they're wild or domestic ruminants or grazing animals, have a role in nature, and their role, particularly particularly in drier climates or what we call brittle climates, is to play the service of biological decay. So when a grass plant grows in a dry climate, the microbes aren't able to break that plant down and and reincorporate it back in the soil. But a grazing animal will go and chew on that grass, run it through their digestion system. They break it down and it comes out their backside ready to reincorporate into the soil. And he realized that native grazers have a very important role to play in an ecosystem why can't we take our domestic grazers and mimic that and have them do the same thing? And so he started working on getting animals to be bunched and moving all the time. When you look at how native animals are, they stay in very tight groups and they move all the time. So you look at the mass migrations in Africa, uh, the wildebeest migrations, there's animals that are bunched and moving all the time. And the reason they're bunched and moving is because of predator pressure. And so he said, we as, as ranchers and farmers, we have to play the role of that predator pressure. We have to keep them bunched and moving. And so that was kind of the start of the thinking. And then you know, really, that's what we today would call rotational grazing. And he took he took what we now call holistic management beyond rotational grazing. So rotational grazing is animals bunched and moving, but you don't really know why. You know, it's like I've worked on ranches where you rotationally graze. You go out in the morning and you're like, no, nah, they got some feed left. I'm going to leave them in this paddock another day. Um, and then you go out the next day and go, oh, shoot, they ate too much feed. All right, I'll move them today. Uh, and you move them to the next place. Holistic management is is really a triple bottom line planning process. It's really the original triple bottom line um, philosophy. I mean, Alan was writing about uh, culture and social mixed with environmental and economic constraints back in the early 60s. I, I, I've never seen anyone else talking about triple bottom line that early. But he realized that we really have to use proactive planning processes so that you get all the right pieces in the right place at the right time for the right reason. So uh, the way that he, you would design this is you'd put you know, all your paddocks on a chart, and we at the Sabre Institute actually have charts pre-made for this, but you put all your paddocks down, and then you put all the external factors in your life on that chart on a calendar. So you've got, you've got your spatial and you've got your temporal all on the same plane, all on the same chart, and you're looking at them together. So you say, boy, in June, we want to take a family vacation. Uh, In August is our low cash flow season. Uh, In May, we have ground nesting birds along the riparian areas and the creeks and rivers. Uh, You put all of those factors down, and then you plan your grazing accordingly. Okay, we don't want to be grazing where the ground nesting birds are. Okay, don't go there. Uh, We need the herd manager to be close to the animals while our family is gone on vacation. Okay, it'd be good for the animals to be in this paddock. Uh, We need... um, you know, low cash flow season, we've got to lay off some help or some labor. Okay, so we want them, the animals to be in the place that, you know, it's easiest for us, the family, to take care of them. Okay, you put that there. You put it all out on a chart, and then you plan it backwards, saying, you know, once you've kind of marked off all the places they shouldn't be, the plan kind of writes itself for where the animals should graze and when. So that's kind of the triple bottom line piece. But the really important piece is that we, 
We don't let animals ever come back to the same paddock until we've had full recovery, uh, full recovery of that grass, which means that not just the, the leaf blade has regrown above the soil, but that there's been full root recovery. Every time an animal chomps a blade of grass, the solar collector's damaged. It has, it has no option to get energy from the sun. So what the grass plant does is it, it sucks up some energy from its roots and it regrows the blade of grass, but it has to let the bottom parts of the roots die to do this. Uh, and that's actually a really good thing. So it sloughs off the bottom of its roots. It regrows the blade of grass. Well, to the farmer or rancher, it looks like the land is recovered. Okay, let's go graze it again. But there's no recovery that's happened in the roots. There's no more uh, savings account uh, to pull from twice. And when that animal bites again, we break what we call the law of the second bite. So that, now that animal's bitten again before we've had full recovery, and eventually that species will die out uh, and, and not be there anymore. And so we're all about having full recovery on both leaf matter and root matter before we come back to a place. So that's put on the plan as well. And then when you see it all in one place, you can design your system for the whole year. So someone who's practicing holistic management can tell you on, on the 1st of January where, an an, where the animals will be on the 1st of September. Um, and they have that all planned out ahead of time. And just like a business plan, you make pivots and adjustments to that over time, but you're starting with a master plan. So you get the big priorities in first uh, and then move forward a cover, uh, accordingly. And it's all based on the principle of recovery. That's kind of the metronome. So that's... That's Alan Savory in holistic management. I'll give a, a brief, uh, just to close out your question, I gave you the long version. They all won't be that way, but that's the long version. Uh, but I'll give you a, a brief little bit on the Savory Institute. So uh, we started in 2009 uh, to really take this work globally in an organized way. So Alan had been uh, working with a number of groups over the last 50, 50 years and I think we're the largest ranching organization in the world. I don't have a hard metric to back that up, but we have trained tens of thousands of producers in ranching all over the globe. And what we found is that uh, changing management and changing the way that, that humans engage with ecology is a little bit like fitness. So, you know, all of us have common sense and know, hey, I should eat better food and be more active. And then some folks take it the next level. Maybe they get some training. They read a book. They take a class. They, they watch something online. And it's like, okay, I'm going to start changing some habits in my life. And they do. And they're doing pretty good for a bit. And then maybe they fall off the wagon and they kind of fall back to old ways. Well, that's kind of where holistic management was up until the early 2000s. You know, you had people that had been trained. They would go and they'd make some changes. But there was still a lot of room for potential growth. And what we realized was going around the globe and, and, and hosting international trainings was great, but we really needed a long-term presence, a, a place and a way for people to get ongoing hand-holding. So to follow the analogy, it's kind of like a personal trainer at that point. Uh, so now you've got somebody that when you go to the fitness club or the gym, that there's somebody there saying, okay, do this, do that. Um, oh, you ate a big piece of chocolate cake last night. No, we're not going to throw the whole program out. Let's just pivot and make a plan and get back on track. And And, and that's really what uh, the Savior Institute started out to do in 2009, and we launched what we call our hub strategy, uh, where we have accredited savory hubs all around the globe, and we currently have 30 of them. We grow by about 10 new hubs per year. Uh, they go through a year of onboarding uh, and entrepreneurial uh, incubation, uh, and basically they get all the tools and training and curriculum and programs and everything that they would need to be successful in their business. So it's a little bit like a like a franchise, but then they take it and make it contextual to their region. So how are we going to be successful in training farmers and healing land with um, – our own social context, our own political context, what's the context of uh, the financial system and the economy in our country and our state, uh, how do we move forward in that way. And so, so we really empower them with all the tools they need, and then they run forward uh, and adapt that to their region to be able to build a plan to impact a huge amount of, of hectares in their, in their country. Uh, we have a big, hairy, audacious goal to um, impact a billion hectares of land by 2025. And to do that, we need 100 hubs that are fully equipped and operating at, at peak performance. But we believe a billion hectares is what it takes to get to food and water security, 
to really see climate change go back in, in the opposite direction, to see the needle start moving in reverse on climate change, uh, and to see global poverty start to, to decrease on a measurable scale. So that's what gets us out of bed in the morning. That's what gets us going. Uh, and that's really been kind of our new way to bring this to the world is through these these local field offices that act as our proxy uh, in a region so that we're not a typical NGO from a Western country moving into the developing world telling people how their lives should be, but rather we have local leaders that, that kind of pick up the torch, take the inspiration from us, and then run with it in their own context, in their own area. Okay, well, thank you so much. I've I, I learned a lot because I've already talked to a few people who do the holistic uh, management on their farm, but not in this detail. Um, so thank you so much for that. But I would like to ask you to um, go a little bit deeper what you said now at the end with your audacious um, goals. And maybe a lot of people might know Alan Savory also from his famous TED talk about desertification. Sorry, about desertification. So maybe mm -hmm. put that a little bit more into the context of desertification and, and um, yeah, climate change so that it's more clear, um, that connection, what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, Alan Savory did a TED Talk in 2011. I should have the hard date on that. Sorry, <laughs> I think it's 2011. Um And since he did that talk, it's become one of the most popular TED Talks of all time. I think it's in the top 75 of the thousands and thousands of TED Talks and then tens of thousands, I think, of TEDx Talks uh, that have happened around the globe. Um, and it's all about how grazing animals can, can actually solve desertification. So to go back to what desertification is, desertification, we're not talking about legitimate native deserts. Desertification is land that used to be fertile and um, prosperous in recollection of human history. So we have we have records that say this land used to be good land, and now it's bad land. Now it's turned a desert. It's it's lost its fertility, um, and it's a process that that really scientists don't know what to do when they when they talk about desertification. They literally put in air quotes unknown processes. We don't know what causes this. Um, and, and we think we do know what causes this. We think that grasslands in areas that are dry, so again, what we call brittle, and, all, and our definition of brittle is a little bit different than arid. Um, so brittle for us is places that get seasonal rainfall and seasonal humidity. So think of, um, you know, in Europe, if you're listening in Europe, think of a Mediterranean climate. So uh, south of France, south, southern Italy, uh, places that have maybe rains in the winter and then are dry all summer. So where I live in California is a perfect example of that. You know, we get rain from October through uh, May typically, and then no rain in June, July, August, September, sometimes not even October either, not a drop of rain. So that is a place that we would consider brittle uh, because what happens there is you've got a rainy season, the grass grows, it goes crazy, uh, other species grow, and then right about the time that the grass is kind of at its peak capacity, it all dries out. And then there's nothing to break that grass down. And this is where, you know, I was saying earlier, the ruminant, the grazing animal, this is where these are the environments that you see the most amount of grazing animals. So they go in and they actually become that role of biological decay. They eat and munch that dead grass and then they actually have the same microbes in their gut that would be in the soil, but the soil microbes are dormant because there's no water. The grazer can get to sources of water, and so she actually feeds them, and there becomes this symbiotic relationship in her rumen between the bacteria uh, and, and then her providing a warm, moist, dark environment for them to thrive. And then she feeds them the grass. They break the grass down, and then she actually lives on the dead microbes, actually are a huge source of protein for livestock and for, for native grazers, and then the broken down grass that they've already broken down for her. Okay, so that's the technical side of grazing, but what happens if the grazer's not there? If the grazer isn't there, then the grass grows and it becomes thatch. So the same way that, that you see you know, all over 
parts of the world, but you know, for now we'll talk about Southern Africa. You see all over Southern Africa, everybody has a thatch roof. Um, that thatch roof doesn't break down or fall apart. The top surface of it turns gray and it stays there for years and years and years. Uh, and usually it's from some sort of animal disturbance or some sort something else that the, the people actually change their thatch roof. Uh, in fact, Alan lives in a very traditional hut uh, along uh, just off the Zambezi in Rhodesia today or in, in Zimbabwe today outside of Victoria Falls. Um, and so we often often look at his thatch roofs and kind of how he uh, he manages them and changes them. But anyway, so the grass is growing up, it dies, and now if there's no grazer, it turns to thatch. And that thatch will just oxidize in the sun. When it oxidizes in the sun, it actually releases greenhouse gases back into the atmosphere. So it turns gray. That's what I mean by oxidation. And then those plant skeletons is what you can think of them as when they're gray. They shade out all future potential growth. So when seedlings are in the soil and want to germinate, they really can't go anywhere because they can't get any sun. They're just a couple of little millimeters high, and you've got this big skeleton of an old grass plant that's shading them out. And so they can't get photosynthesis, and nothing happens. And over over time and you think of you know just a couple of years you could see the impact of that you start playing that over decades and centuries of uh, a piece of land not having biological decay occur it turns to a desert and that's the essence of what desertification is and so what alan found in his journey of going from being an anti-rancher to being pro rancher or or pro livestock farmers they're called in, in most of the world you find that the animals, when they're properly managed, actually heal the land. They're actually providing a a positive role and being a catalyst for good in those environments. And so that was the big shift, is that we have to get people to understand that livestock are a tool. And think of a tool like a hammer. A hammer can build a house or it can tear a house down. And most of the example the world seeing today in mass media is examples of livestock being managed incorrectly, where they're staying in one place all the time, we're not managing them holistically, we're not building recovery into the system, and we're seeing land degrade. And this is happening on a massive scale. The UN has whole departments that work on desertification. And really right now there aren't, there aren't great answers out there. Uh, and we think a huge part of this is getting domestic grazers that we already have that, that ranchers and livestock farmers of all kinds already have in their possession, managing them differently to mimic the habits that native grazers used to fill and that we can actually heal these lands. And it doesn't take money. We don't need capital. It doesn't take technology. We don't need fancy tractors and drones and anything like that. All we need is to get people to change the way that they're managing those animals, the way that they're moving them, the way that they're bringing them back, the way that they engage with their environment is what needs to change. So the barrier is between our ears uh, and getting people to make those changes and adjustments and then stick with them. And as we are the Wool Academy podcast, what is there the role then of the wool industry? Yeah, so so sheep are amazing animals for you know a number of reasons. I've, I've raised uh, a number of, of breeds of sheep in my life and have, have always enjoyed raising them because, you know, there's this one long ancestral history of sheep. There's a primal connection there of, of humans herding sheep all around the world. Uh, the amazing thing about sheep for me is that they're pretty amazing meat animals. They're incredible fiber animals. I think they're unparalleled to anything else in, in the, in the fiber world. And, and then there's a, a reemergence of, of dairy sheep. We're really seeing dairy animals come back. And so there's so much utility there. The other thing that I really like about sheep is that they're small. And so that, I mean, that sounds obvious, but, um, for a small holder that provides a lot of flexibility. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of young people that come back to agriculture come to sheep first because whether they're novice or maybe it's somebody of smaller stature um, or, or, or maybe an elderly person of less strength, um, that sheep are so much less intimidating than your larger you know, bison or cattle um, or maybe what we think of more at least in America, as traditional uh, ranching or farming. But, but sheep has tr – conventional is a better word, <laughs> not traditional. Uh, but sheep just has so much potential. And so um, you know, we work with, with wool growers all around the world. We have um, hubs in Australia and South Africa uh, and both in Chile and Argentina uh, that all focus the, 
the vast majority of their training and implementation support on the wool industry. And so wool is a huge part of this. And, and I think that um, I think we're seeing on the flip side, I think we're seeing millennials and the next generation, whatever we're calling the generation after millennials, I forget, uh, X, Y, Z, we've got you know, all the letters. But um, I think we're seeing consumer habits really come back to natural fibers. I mean, the notion to me that that polyester and rayon and all of these synthetic components that come from petroleum would be more sustainable than a natural fiber is a total farce. It makes no common sense. And I think the consumer is starting to get this. Uh, you start to look at the, the life cycle of a, of a, you know, a, a polyester uh, jacket or a, a rain slicker or something like that uh, and how long it lands in a, lasts in a landfill it's made out of the same stuff that plastic bags are made out of. And, and, and most municipalities around the world are, are starting to wake up that we have to ban plastic bags. You know, even, even in the developing world, you see all over that people are, are really removing plastic bags from their supply chains as much as they can. Well, shoot, your clothes are made out of the same things. And so I think we're really seeing people start to come around to wool as a really amazing amazing textile uh, when you think of all the properties it has that it could be robust and durable and it can be soft and silky and luxurious and it can um, you know is great at, at odor control and really has such longevity and durability to it um, and I think that's why we see really classic pieces in wool still be popular today but I think we're gonna see that move into more um, trending fashion um, as, as really a popularity where we're going to see styles really move into wool um, that aren't necessarily as classic, that are more um, um, annual fashion lines and not so much our perennial fashion lines. But I just think wool is amazing. I think it's a huge part of uh, the solution and the wool industry has so much potential and such a story that it can tell. Yeah, and one way you are attempting to tell the story, if I understand correctly, is by developing a new label called Land to Market. So maybe tell us a little bit more about the label and why it was created. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll give a little background on kind of how we got here. So in about the 80s, we, uh, the early 80s, we, we launched a new methodology that really everyone who got trained in holistic management after like 82, 83, um, got trained in something called biological monitoring. And so it's a way that we taught ranchers and livestock farmers to look at their land and measure the land health. Uh, so it helps them make better decisions. So just like in any management plan, you say, okay, here's what I'm going to do in the next 12 months. Okay, where are the first places that I would see that maybe some of my assumptions are wrong? And monitoring the health of the biology is a huge one for, for ranchers and, and livestock farmers. And so, so that we developed a protocol there. And about five years ago, about the time we were launching the first hubs to come on board, we said, boy, you know, there's a pretty cool big data play. We've got all these ranchers, you know, that have, have 30 years of history of, of monitoring the health of their land. What if we could start to aggregate that data? on like a like a global platform uh think of all the measurements that we could we could and and correlations we could find as we started you know chopping this data up and and looking at it different ways and so we started to partner with some academic um players so uh the nature conservancy and and some researchers at texas a and m uh, michigan state university is is actually the first savory hub Uh, at a university, and so there are major players in this. We worked with uh, Sydney University in Australia, some players at South Africa University, um, and we put together kind of a consortium and said, okay, here's how we measure land health. Um, you know, help us, help us work on this. And some, some researchers very candidly but, but gently said, you know, what you have is great, um, but it's really only going to be valid for internal decisions on the ranch. The way this data is collected is not empirical enough for the scientific community uh, to really be able to consider a, a health measurement of the land. And so we said, okay, help us. Let's, let's tear this program down to its nuts and bolts and rebuild it. And we spent three years doing that, and we prototyped it on, a, on about 300 farms in South America as we were doing this uh, in partnership with our hub there, Ovis 21, and their uh, rangeland ecologist, Pablo Borelli, who I'm, I'm sure a number of listeners may, may know. Um, and so we broke this down. 
and built it back up. And what we came up with is, is a program we now call Ecological Outcome Verification, or what we'll colloquially call EOV. Um, and EOV, we look at a number of markers across the land. We look at soil organic matter and carbon and water infiltration rates. We look at biodiversity on three planes. We look at biodiversity in soil microbiology. We look at uh, plant diversity. We look at wildlife populations on the more macro scale. And then we look at the four ecosystem functions. We look at uh, photosynthesis capture and energy flow through the system. We look at mineral cycling, water cycling, and community community dynamics and community dynamics means you know what are the ages of the species how are the species interacting with one another you know is this uh, a field of corn where everything's exactly the same age and the same species or is this a diverse perennial polyculture where you have all sorts of different species at different ages all filling different niches and roles in the ecosystem um, and we we have uh, 16 measurements that we look at on that spectrum of those things that I just mentioned and we roll that up into a score, what we call an ecological health index. Uh, and all of this data is collected by an auditor. The same way that you have you know, other certifications out there that have an auditor, we would have an auditor that would come out and collect this data and plug it into the uh, platform that goes into this cloud-based platform. And then we trend that data over time. So what we're really interested in is properties that are having net positive results on the land, i.e. the land is getting better, it's healing, while it's producing high quality products for human use and consumption. And we would call that regenerative. And that's just kind of a term that's emerging in the agriculture space. And regenerative, if you've not heard it before, you could just think of it as net positive results without compromising on, on what you produce. And that's really exciting to us because we think that consumers up to this point, even the most green and eco-conscious, whatever you know term you want to use to call them, the most green consumers, I think they're in, a, in a, a mindset that says, I want to do the least amount of bad. What we're doing is flipping the script and saying, you don't actually have to do the least amount of, of bad. You can actually be part of the good, that we can actually flip this around and have net positive results, that you can actually play a role in healing the land. And so... We launched EOV, so that's the Ecological Outcome Verification, and we, like I said, we prototyped it in South America, and then last year we uh, onboarded about half of our hubs to get trained and start working on this in their region, and those hubs all picked about 15 or 20 farms in their area that they kind of handpicked at this stage to say, these are the ones we want to work with at the, at the early stages and get them on board. So they went out and they did the baseline measurements. I should also point out that all the baseline measurements, when or any time that we're doing a data collection, it's compared to a regional baseline. So that, that normalizes the score. So if there's weather events or climate changes or things that happen that are outside of the rancher or livestock farmer's control, it normalizes that. So we're able to compare then a property in Belgium to a property in Australia to a property in Turkey because they've all been normalized against a regional baseline. So the auditor goes out, they collect the data, and then they put it into this, this platform, and then we trend that data over time. So we're looking for those, those net positive results. And that was all super exciting to us. Like we were happy as clams. And then some of the brand partners that we work with that work in, in retail and, uh, um, you know, in both apparel and food came to us and said, you know, this is, this is a pretty cool deal. We would love to be able to access that supply, move it through our supply chain and tell the story of regeneration to our consumers. And so as we've been building the supply side around the globe, so we've got about 150 farms globally plus a big chunk um, in uh, Argentina uh, that was part of our first pilot, second pilot was global. We've got these farms all around the world that have had early measurements done. Now we're moving into a retail prototype phase where brands are saying, hey, we want to move product through our supply chains, communicate this story to consumers. And that's, that's where Land to Market is today. So 2018 is all about uh, a prototype with these early brands. We're working with brands that are super well aligned with us in mission, that want to invest 
both financially and resources to making this a reality and help us co-author the go-to-market strategy uh, to help us open this up globally in 2019 uh, to where really we're bringing on farms, you know, hog wild. Uh, we'll have, I mean, even by end of quarter one, we'll have about 300 farms globally uh, around the world. Right now, most of our work is happening in the Southern Hemisphere because we work in the growing season. Uh, and so that's the growing season right now in the Southern Hemisphere. And then we'll move back to the Northern Hemisphere uh, around March or April and get into the growing season up here. So we're just onboarding producers all the time. And now we're working with brands and onboarding them and getting and making the connection between the two, which is why we call the program Land to Market. Um, so that's where we are. We're making a big splash at a food show uh, in Southern California called Expo West. They get about 80,000 people, uh, every, 80 to 100,000 people. It's the largest natural food show, I think, in the world. Uh, and that'll be kind of our first real big press display on the food space. But the categories that we're working in in the prototype are meat, dairy, wool, leather, and I'm hoping to have a cashmere project by the end of the year in Mongolia. Um, so those are the four or five categories that we're in. And I should point out meat, we're also in in like pet foods and things like that. Uh, and by quarter four this year, we'll see products on shelves that actually have a label on them that says this product is regenerative. This product made the land better as a result of how it was produced and managed. Wow, that that's a big, big project, and and it yeah it sounds very promising. But when you also talked about the land to market um, label in Port Elizabeth last December, you also raised the question: so why do we actually need another label? Because there are already so many, and it's already quite confusing for consumers to distinguish mm -hmm. what is for what. So, what is your answer to that que question? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that. Yeah, yeah. Label fatigue is one you hear a lot in in the U.S. We call it NASCARing, is what you hear a lot. So, if if you know uh, folks are, are in any way in places where they're familiar with racing, you know that in racing there's these sponsors all over the cars. And so, uh, you know, the big the big race industry here is called NASCAR. So we call it NASCARing um, to where you get these products just covered with labels that the consumers don't really know, necessarily know what they mean. The, you know, the producers and the brands are really just involved to have, you know, one more kind of check mark to put next to their name. Um, and so, so that, that's, a big talk in all of these sectors, whether it goes from food to textile, is is how many certifications do we need and, and what do they accomplish? You know, I look at this a little bit differently, and I, I first would, would posit that I don't think that one certification is ever going to meet all of the brand's needs and the consumer's needs. It's important to keep in mind that in, in textile, a lot of these certifications are more for sustainability ratings that get communicated to shareholders and key stakeholders, investors, things like that, uh, that aren't necessarily public facing. You know, when you, when you pick up a coach bag, you don't, you don't see anything on there, you know, any sort of labels or a, a you know, Gucci bag or whatever it is. doesn't mean that company is not participating in programs. It just means that consumers haven't really associated textile and fashion yet with, with labels the same way that they have in food. Um, But it doesn't mean the, the brand isn't subscribed to 30 of them. You know, it could be could be a number. And so we, we often talk about this certifica certification fatigue. And and I think it's a real issue. But I think that we have to keep in mind you're not going to have one that serves everybody's needs. The other thing that's important to keep in mind is that certifications, and I'm going to I'm going to delineate between certification and verification. Certification, in, in my mind, the way that, that I Would, would see this in the world, is all of our kind of standard practice-based certifications. So they say, um, you know, we're going to use organic, for example, or, or biologic, because it's the most ubiquitous globally and people can relate with. But I'm, I'm in no way saying bad things about organic or biologic certification. But um, in organic certification, they tell the producer, here's what you're allowed to do. Here's what you're not allowed to do. And then if you kind of stay in those guidelines, you get the stamp of approval. You're organic. Really, all that really says is we didn't use chemicals. We didn't use synthetic chemicals. And I don't want chemicals in my food. I'm a total organic believer and supporter. And I think that's great. But we didn't measure the outcomes. What actually happened on the land? We all assume good things happen, and they probably do. But we didn't quantify them. And we really saw a hole in the marketplace 
t to measure outcomes in an empirical way with standardized science, with auditors and third party to come in and say, let's measure the outcomes that's actually happening in all these different schemes we're involved in. Let's get a quantifiable measurement. And that's really what land to market is all about, is it's about measuring outcomes. So if a producer wants to be organic, they can. If they want to be fair trade, they can. If they want to be non-GMO verified, they can. They can play in all these other schemes, and it still dovetails with what we're doing because we're picking up the pieces of saying, okay, maybe you're involved with these other programs, but here we're going to measure the outcomes of what actually happens in the land. And we think that's really liberating because we think farmers and ranchers and most I would say a bit more than half of, of the people on our team come from a production background like, like I do. Um, we think ranchers and farmers are total innovators. They will give the consuming public what they want. And right now what the consuming public has asked for is cheap and fast food and cheap and fast textile. And that is the system that has developed. And if we want to communicate different things from the, from the supply chain as consumers, those things have to be measured and monitored. And that's what we think that next step is really in that quantification piece. So that's what Land to Market's all about. And that's our big differentiator. Um, and I think that we will have to move carefully into that certification fatigue space. Um, but I, I, I also think that EOV, the ecological outcome verification, could actually become the intel inside, just like your computer is is branded, you know, some PC brand, but the the processor inside is is an Intel chip. EOV could be the Intel chip in some of these certifications as they want to move into more of an outcome based uh, sector. And I think as we see programs like HIG and environmental profit and loss and other of these true cost accounting or, or impact accounting schemes also get more traction. All of those programs self-admittedly have the least amount of data on tier four or on raw material sourcing. And EOV and land to market can, can plug right into that. So you know what we offer brands is verified supply in a roster of producers. We can actually work with their existing supply chain. So if they already have a producer network they work with that they wanna get verified, we can go out and do the verification for them. Those that struggle and aren't able to get into a net positive category on their own, we can mobilize resources. We've got these centers around the globe and we've got thousands and thousands of trained accredited professional educators that can go and help get people over the line. And then we, all, we also have storytelling for brands. So we have amazing stories to tell, endless miles or kilometers of runway for um, – for brands to be able to tap into an authentic, real stories. And then we have data. So the brands that want to communicate, hey, through our purchasing, we were able to uh, restore water, water tables. We were able to bring back habitats. We saw um, charismatic species populations increase by X amount. We sequestered carbon by X amount. All of those things can be packaged for that brand and put together for them that they can communicate to their consumers. And that's all part of a new trend called insetting, where you know in the in in the old world brands would you know kind of access their supply chains, make their connections, and then go, okay, we're doing X amount of bad in the world. How are we going to offset that? And they would participate in what's called outsetting. So, okay, let's get uh, fuel efficient vehicles. Let's get LED lights in the retail stores. Let's put solar panels in all the factories. That's all still good. We want that to keep happening. The next step, though, for business and industry is to say, let's overhaul our supply chains. Let's actually get our raw materials from lands that are being healed as a result of how they're managing. And then that's insetting. You're actually getting your goals accomplished for your social and environmental impact through your own supply chain. Uh, so we need both insetting and outsetting to happen simultaneously. But really, insetting is kind of the new trend. And land to market just dovetails beautifully into that and falls right into where brands are already trying to head. So we can come alongside as a partner and work with those brands and help them um, get to that place. Yeah, and you mentioned now several times uh, the importance of storytelling. And my question here is, um, and you said that also at the Wood on Table, that there's there has been now a big disconnect between the producers and the consumers and you even said that consumers are illiterate about rural agriculture but i think with the new technology that's that's now um that now exists things mm -hmm. are changing so can you speak a little bit about this 
process of agriculture and the consumer moving closer together and what role maybe also the storytelling then plays? Yeah, I think I use a quote a lot and I stole this from a, an, an ecologist and I don't say this this pompously. I say this as kind of owning it for all of humanity and, and, and certainly myself included. But I think we live in the most ecologically illiterate society of all time, of all of human civilization. And, and you don't have to take offense to that. If you just zoom back, we are just the least connected of any other civilization in history with where our products come from, where raw materials are produced. And in every other period of time, we had to have closer connections and closer ties. And now supply chains are longer and darker than they've ever been before. And I think even if there's a misunderstanding about how ecology works, there is a deep and primal yearning from consumers, particularly the next generation, these, these millennials and Gen Z, that really want to see transparency and traceability be a primary focus of the products that they get and use and consume and become loyal to. Uh, and I think we see some, some early leaders in that space that are coming out that are really being frank about, here's what we're doing, here's what we aren't quite doing yet, but we want to get better at. Um, and that's a fine line to walk for a brand. It's, it's a hard place to be that, that vulnerable uh, and that transparent. But I think that's really where we're headed. And I think a lot of brands still have their head in the sand on that and aren't quite realizing how much consumer habits are going to change in the next 20 to 30 years. Um, and so I think there's this deep primal connection to connect back to these places, to go back to things that are wild and free and... I think a huge part of that, I almost even take that transparency and traceability kind of buzz phrase and, and, and I boil it down to something that I think is, is simpler and easier to capture of authenticity. I think that most consumers feel like they get the raw deal. They don't know what to, to trust. We live in a world of greenwashing where everything has a great story and it's like, yeah, but our planet's getting worse. How can that be so? And I think the thing people want most is authenticity. So I'm, I'm a huge believer in, in storytelling marketing. I think that uh, it's, it's very deep in how we communicate is through story. And, and being able to relate with somebody in a different culture, a different place, um, an, an entirely different environment and, and livelihood – is something really cool. And so when we can use these tools like social media and video and even audio like what we're doing right now, um, when we can connect people around the globe and you get those visceral connections and it's like, I can relate with that person even though I don't know anything about what it's like to be a, um, a rancher or a livestock farmer in uh, Argentina, let's say. Um, I can relate with that person. I'm hearing their struggle. I'm seeing their successes. I'm, I'm understanding what they're excited about. That, that makes deeper connections than traditional marketing where you just run through you know, a product spec list and here, here's what makes my product better than the other competitors in the market. Um, and I think that's really the next, the next phase of how we communicate with consumers is one – We have to be legitimate about this. We have to make these connections and understand as companies what, what our impact is on the environment and, and what we're doing to make that better. But then I think the next step in that is not to just have that be an internal program for a sustainability rating or for internal decisions, but really start to connect consumers with that and say, listen, this handbag that you buy, these – this." Um, You know, the outdoor industry is, is, is really amazing in this um, because I think outdoor has land health built into their DNA because they're making products, whether it's, you know, t climbing gear or snowshoes or, or technical jackets or, you know, camping equipment, whatever it is. They're all designed to be enjoyed in the great outdoors. And so I think they're probably a little further than luxury and, 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 and other sectors, that, you know, fast fashion um, in understanding that. Where these products get used is, is what can, their, their target demographics hold dear. And I think we're going to see that start to move into other sectors as we're just having a, a global awakening and consciousness to we can't forget the land. We can't forget the water. We can't forget the wildlife in our decisions every day, whether you live in 
you know, Munich or New York City or uh, London or wherever it is, we cannot forget the supply line that supports us. And that has to be um, something that, that we hold dear and becomes part of our cultural values again. And I think that storytelling, as that emerging emergence is happening, I think that storytelling marketing is, is just going to continue to grow on that front. And I'd like to dig a little bit deeper on, on storytelling because when I talk to some of the growers and also to some of the, you know, Uh, top makers or wool exporters, they struggle quite a bit on actually how to tell a story. And and can you maybe give a few examples or one example where you told a story and that was successful? Yeah, so um, you know, I should, should probably mention it at any point here. If people want to learn more about land to market, you can go to savory.global slash land to market, all one word. Uh, and on there, we have four episodes that we made that tell – so these four episodes are the story of meat, the story of dairy, the story of wool, and the story of leather. Uh, and they look at the supply chain on each of these sectors and kind of what the challenges are, what the opportunities are. Um, and we intentionally on each of those, we, we wove stories together. We didn't want to tell – The story, these are long format, so we had some flexibility here. These are 17 minute clips, which it's funny that today that's considered long format. <laughs> Everything is getting down to uh, a couple of years ago, it was like, oh, yeah, people don't have an attention span of longer than five minutes. And then it was three minutes, and now we're down to 60 seconds or less to really, you know, <laughs> top of the sales funnel capture people. But but we kind of broke the mold a little bit and said, we want to we want to go with something a little longer format. So these are like 17 to 20 minutes. And, and we focused on telling a minimum of three stories wove together under the same theme. And the reason we did that is there are some standout players in this movement that are, you know, whether it's brands or whether it's, uh, you know, factories or processors, whether it's producers. And sometimes those get kind of highlighted as the anomaly. We wanted to weave stories together from different parts of the world from different producers and different key stakeholders in the supply chain to show this is global. This movement, it is emergent. It's not, it's not at critical mass yet. The flywheel is still getting going, but this is really a global movement. And this has huge connections to all consumers. Uh, and I think that's, that's the key is how do you make the connections with consumers? So the same way that we've always targeted consumers habits and, what they like and don't like, we're really taking the next step and going, let's target consumers on their core values and let's align them with people in our own supply chains and our own supply lines that share those values and make, again, those visceral connections. So um, if, you, if people want to see an example of those kinds of stories, please go check out that savory.global slash land to market. Uh, and we've got a lot more media coming. We went to Let's see, we did these, the production for this was two years ago, and we released them um, um, late, late that year in like November. Um, but we went to 25 locations on three continents in a matter of four months, I think, with a full media crew um, to put these together. And then we edited them for another two or three months after that. Uh, and we've got a lot of new media coming out this year. So I've actually uh, just diving deep in with our editing team this week on getting our media scope put together for the rest of the year and, and getting that all lined out. So, but yeah, absolutely. I think, I think story is the answer. I think that, that people want to um, want to make those connection. I love the book. There's a guy um, uh, based here in the States named Jonas Sachs, and he wrote a book called The Story Wars. And uh, if people Google Jonas Sachs Story Wars, there's a great little like intro video on how in the digital era, we're actually going back to storytelling, you know, more than we were in the mass media era of, of television and, and, you know, traditional newspapers and things like that. So people are sourcing their information in a more peer to peer basis. And it's bringing back this whole storytelling, which really allows things to go viral and it allows people to, you know, find sects of their own uh, belief systems and then share stories amongst themselves. So it's a cool, exciting time, but I think there's a lot of change on the horizon too. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'll make sure to link to those videos that you just mentioned in the show notes. And is the address, web address you just mentioned also where people should go if they wanted to get more involved in the land to market 
Yeah, mm-hmm. at the bottom of that page, um, just below the videos, we've got a place that you know if if you you know you're a consumer or a citizen, you want to you know learn more, you can click in and get uh, you know on an update list. If you're a brand or retailer that you know wants to learn more, how do I get involved? If you're a producer and you want to figure out how to you know get your land verified or maybe get help in training or support, um, you know all of that is available, so you can get on the right list. And get updated, uh, and then just to, just so people know, just you know, full transparency and authenticity on our side, we are still in that prototype phase. So, um, you know, right now we're we're onboarding as many producers as we can near hubs, uh, and then brands we're really you know wanting to stay with those that are most mission aligned. It doesn't mean that we have to have an existing relationship with them, but we're just really being um, kind of cherry picking the brands that want to work with us. And and those brands are also putting, like I said, money and resources in to co-author this and kind of work on it together so that we've got a really sound go-to-market strategy. And then uh, in 2019, we'll open it up kind of as a broader array. So um, don't be discouraged from getting on the list and checking it out. Like all programs, you know, this has got, you know, kind of a scale up that has to happen. Um, And we've been kind of working on this behind the scenes, behind the curtains, under the hood, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, for three or four years now. And we're we're starting to unveil it and, and get get press involved as well and start start telling again telling the story and making those connections and this thing's just going to grow exponentially from here we've got a lot of really cool pieces in place that are starting to take off and like i said you'll see product on shelves in quarter four and from there on it's just going to be uh going bananas so yeah it's exciting (laughs) well thank you so much chris for introducing us to the savory institute and also explaining us more details about desertification and how sheep can help us reverse desertification and of course about your land to market scheme and i wish you lots of success for all your goals and thank you again for your time thank you so much for having me it was a pleasure to be on and i uh, appreciate uh, you giving me the time and, and continuing the conversation so thank you wonderful thank you and bye-bye bye this was a long interview today but i think it was worth taking the time to let Chris explain and answer all the questions. If you want to follow up on anything that Chris mentioned in today's episode, just head on over to the show notes at elizabethvandellen.com forward slash 071. You will find all the links Chris mentioned along with other things at elizabethvandellen.com forward slash 071. If you are active on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter or LinkedIn, then make sure to follow us on these platforms so that you are always alerted when a new podcast is coming out. I look forward to connecting with you there. Thank you and bye for now.